Hello again, welcome back to the Daily Bible Study. We are continuing on with the book of Revelation. Uh, we are in chapter one, kind of this setting out of various things. And uh, we're we'll pick up in verse nine and kind of go to the end of the chapter. Like I said, some of these chapters, some of these sections might be long throughout the course of this journey. Uh, and not least because I'm not sure always, I don't know the book well enough to know exactly where the most organic changing points are. And also because... Um, Honestly, I kind of want to get through this as quickly as possible because uh, I am so overwhelmingly intimidated by this book. Uh, so if you are as well, uh, don't feel like you are alone. Um, but in any case, before we, uh, before we read it, let's pray. Uh, loving God, you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we are here reading what was called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to see Jesus in this text. Help us to see what you are doing in our midst, what you have done in the past, and how we can learn and grow from uh, this remarkable book. Lord, we ask you to be with us during this time, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we pick up here, and we read, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held out seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so I want to say a thing about seven, first of all, because I, you are probably like me in the sense that you have heard this idea of seven is somehow a divine number, that seven is somehow a sign of completeness. And I think that there's definitely a way in which it gets used that way throughout the book of Revelation, especially when we talk about the mark of the beast way down the line. But here's the thing. We don't generally have seven established throughout the length and breadth of the Bible as being a sign of completeness or even a sign of divinity. Seven... So let me say, so there's, there are, I'm talking about, I'm setting a pretty high bar for what I mean when numbers are going to mean something. I've shared this before. Um, like the number 12 has an established history of meaning throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament in particular, and well into the New Testament. And that is 12 means Israel. We see it throughout the New Testament. It's used as a way to do that. You know, the fact that there were 12 disciples is very clearly meant to be the, like the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, when there's 12 baskets of leftovers after feeding the 5,000, it's very clearly meant to be that. We're going to see number 12 show up several times here being representative of the people of God. Um, we do not have anywhere near the same kind of um, track record of meaning for seven, certainly not in the sense of divinity or completeness. What we do see is seven is used occasionally, at least in the Old Testament, for the nations. Uh, more, more often you'll see 77 or 70 um, being used for the nations because there's a list in, in Genesis where it talks about kind of the propagation of the earth after Noah's flood, or Noah and the flood during Noah's lifetime. And, um, and in doing so, uh, there's a list of 70-ish you know, names of, of kind of people and nations. And so the, so 70 or 70, something along those lines is listed as being um, the, the nature of the people, of the nations of the world. And so to a certain degree, you know, there's almost, as, there are seven churches being listed here. And it may be that there's seven particularly important churches in this area called Asia Minor. Um, we would have just been called Asia at the time. Um, or it's meant to symbolize that this is, this is to the nations, you know, the light to the nations, these lampstands among all the people. Um, I don't know, but I just want to be clear about the fact early on that um, it may be that it is clear that Revelation is using the word seven in the sense of divinity, in the sense of completion, but we don't have that established in the Old Testament, at least not in the same way that we do have, for example, the significance of the number 12 established throughout um, the Old and New Testament. So I think it's an important thing to, to list. These seven churches, we're going to read letters to each of these seven churches uh, here as we go. And um, they're going to be, again, these are all in what we would call today Asia Minor, kind of modern day Turkey. Um, I believe they're all in that area. 
Um, so we have these lampstands, and lampstands have been historically established as being the presence of God uh, in various ways throughout the temple. Um, we see this one who's like a son of man. Um, son of man on one level just simply means human person. We see it used that way at some points uh, throughout the Old Testament. We do have a particular account, and I believe it's the book of Daniel, where it says, you know, I'm going to send one like, a, I saw one like a son of man. And it, um, and it definitely does come off as being this heavenly type creature. And so the son of man was then taken up by Jesus as a symbol for who he was. And so it's very clearly meant to symbolize that whoever it is that this John is seeing, uh, it's meant to be representing Jesus at the very least um, and staying that way. And not and so not only this to have seven stars, this idea of kind of ruling over the nations, uh, but also out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, which is a reference to uh, the word of God um, that I believe is Revel or Hebrews talks about being sharpened than two-edged sword. Uh, we also have an example of uh, the word of God uh, being that something that, that actually is eaten throughout the Old Testament in various ways. Um, so there's all kinds of symbols there. And this idea of I have the keys of hell and death, um, or sorry, death and Hades in this translation. And so we have this revelation here. And another note here is that uh, John is being talked about here. Um, and so sometimes you'll hear that, that this John is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John and the letters of John. Um, I am not convinced that that's the case. Um, having spent a little bit of time with Greek, um, John, both the Gospel and the letters are, are very, what you could call easy Greek, very kind of basic Greek, very clear. Um, very easy to translate, and uh, Revelation is very much not the case. So it is possible that suddenly the same John got to be very sophisticated in his writing, uh, but I'm not so certain that that's the, the most natural way to explain this. I think that John being a relatively common name, that this is a different John. Um, it does describe this John as being on an island called Patmos both because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I don't know enough about Patmos. I don't know if the history and part of my whole thing with these free form reflections is that I'm not doing a lot of research to prepare for these. And this is where I'm going to feel it the most. Um, one could say that he was there because of the word of God, meaning that God called him there. But because of the testimony of Jesus makes me wonder if maybe he is that, that maybe the Isle of Patmos was a prison area um, in some way. I don't know that for sure. So again, like take everything I'm saying here with a grain of salt. Um, but in any case, we are setting the stage of being a dramatic, you know, there's going to be a message being sent to these major major churches in the area. Um, but they're not also, they're also not major in the sense that it's not like Jerusalem. It's not like Antioch. It's not like Alexandria. Uh, it's definitely a message being written to a particular region and not necessarily um, to the biggest churches around. There's, so maybe there's something going on with those seven churches in particular. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know. But we're going to look then for the rest of this week and starting into next week, we're going to look at these, these letters to these seven churches. And um, so those, those, are, those are some of the more clear bits uh, in this book. And so uh, once we get past those, then I'm really going to be out of my depth. But in any case, uh, that's all for today. Come back in tomorrow and we will look at the first of these letters to the seven churches. Have a good day.